Hey guys, this is Coach Keita Bussey with 180 Firearms Training, Grant Chancellor Madison, Paul Hag Antonio, and Alex, I'm not sure your last name. Agapakis. Okay, I'm not gonna even attempt that. <laughs> but welcome to the 180 Firearms Training Podcast. <laughs> Good to see you, Kira. How's it going? It's good. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, I'm Paul Hagi Antonio. Um, people know me from South Africa and Australia. I'm now in Greece permanently. Um, been shooting a long time. I uh, believe the IPC community know of me. Done a bit of training and having a great time shooting in Greece. Wonderful. How about you, Alex? I am Alex. I'm coming originally from Greece. I started a few years ago IPC training and uh, also shooting. Um, I had the honor to have a very good friend here, Paul with us in Greece, the, la the latest months. I enjoy shooting. I am a captain and professional uh, diver for a living. And I enjoy all the company of you. And Wonderful. I hope to see you soon. Yeah, we're yes. going to see you soon, yeah, definitely. Sure. Yes. All right, why don't you tell our audience about what you mean by that? Okay, so I don't remember how long ago. It would be probably two years ago now, Kida. Um, in Australia, we were looking for the edge with our shooting, not only for myself, but with some other very good shooters there and for some shooters that were looking to improve their skills because your course caters for the majority of shooters in IPSC and USPSA. And we decided to make plans to get Kira over to Australia to do a couple of courses. We successfully did that. And we had a very good time having our first course in Brisbane at one of the local clubs there, City of Brisbane Pistol Club. And then we did the second course about five hours drive away in a place called Raglan, which is in the countryside. And we had, we had filled both courses. I was fortunate enough to do both courses. And we learned a lot. Uh, Kita's courses are, are fully comprehensive um, when it comes to improving your movement, efficiency of movement. And there's a lot more that goes into shooting than just pulling the trigger, as we, we now know. And we, we try to minimize our times on stages, not by shooting faster, but by giving ourselves more time to shoot by moving efficiently and, and getting from A to B quickly as quickly as possible so we can actually shoot off as more we try to yeah, um, there's the that yeah that dead time exactly and and you know you can spin around in a circle all day you're still not going anywhere so efficiency of movements i think one of the biggest subjects in dynamic shooting now i think this is really interesting that you were in the sport for so long you were a competitor during the time before movement was ever a thing Nobody was teaching movement. So I did all of the original research and wrote the book and made the class and introduced this movement training into the shooting sports. And now it's common knowledge. What do you think about that? Have you seen a change? I've definitely seen a change. I'm, I'm thinking back to my beginnings in IPSC in 2002 and movement wasn't a big thing. We just shot and we moved because we had to um and then it changed yes and with your course and your course material in your book it highlighted the importance of of having a system to move having a way to leave a position entry and exit um and and maximizing your movement minimizing the time it takes so yes i've definitely seen a change people are now starting to realize that you don't go faster you don't bring your stage times down by pulling the trigger faster and risking penalties and mics especially on the targets that demand that focus and attention um, you do it by by going faster on everything else or, or doing it more efficiently and that's where your analysis of the sport and your degrees in in your expertise your field of expertise come in and you isolated all those components and put them into a course that's digestible um, so to answer your question absolutely yes it's 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 more highlighted. It's more known of now. People are talking about it and doing it. 
and and you've done a lot of courses by now and people are seeing the benefits of it i mean i'd won eight national championships in this eight i think seven or eight in australia before i did your courses and i was knocking times down on stages um yeah focusing, you took, focusing what, two or on three seconds off I think one of the biggest stages and still maintaining a healthy score, um, I took three seconds off a stage. Yeah, and we did it repeatedly. It wasn't, it wasn't that we had practiced the stage to death and we shoot the stage cold. And mm -hmm. after a bit of coaching and putting the techniques into, into practice, um, you shoot the stage again and, and you look at the times and it definitely works. And it's not just the movement, as you know, there's so much more you do on your courses with vision. Right, the vision training too. Yeah, excuse the noise in the background. We we on an island we just shot a match and Wi-Fi is the luxury, yeah. And the only place we could get a good signal was in a restaurant. Yeah, no worries. So tell us about the upcoming courses in Greece. <clears throat> the upcoming course in Greece. Okay, so we definitely looking at June. Um, I put a preliminary post out and there is a lot of interest. Uh, there's people inquiring from all parts of Europe. So we're looking at international visitors too, to Greece. Um, we can talk about the location and the food all day, but yeah, we, Greece is a very unique country as most countries are. There's obviously something unique with every country when it comes to the difficulties with our sports. Um, but Greece is difficult because we're not allowed to reload ammunition yet. So the training that people do get with the cost of factory ammunition is minimal and we actually have some exceptionally good shooters uh, when you look at the standard of shooting it's very very good considering they don't get to do those thousand round days mm -hmm. or 500 round days like i used to in australia um so i take my hats off to the guys that work really really hard uh, we do lack that next level of expertise that you bring to the table and uh, people are genuinely interested uh, your name has become quite synonymous with movement and the efficiency of, of the movement and people are interested and that's really, really good. So we're excited to offer hopefully two full courses in Greece, hosted by yourself, obviously, as the coach. And we're going to be honored to have Alex Kruzi with us and myself assisting on those courses. And we'll fill in any gaps that might need covering with some of the shooters with their techniques and help and assist and, and just um, have a great time together. And, and try and improve the standard across the board. We're going to go to some really good locations. We're looking at a place in north of Greece, which makes it accessible for the majority of Greek shooters, called Pirgetos. Um, they have a fantastic facility. They've spent over a million euros um, getting that place up to standard. And the gentleman that, that owns it has come from a tennis background. And it's not like a normal shooting range. He's got all the luxuries, fireplaces, uh, wooden cabins. It's just beautiful. And they do a lot of shotgun shooting their trap and skeet. So we want to use that facility in the mountains for our first course. Um, Thessaloniki is pretty close to Piriotos. So anybody flying in internationally can come into Thessaloniki to attend that course. Um, the ocean's not too far away. It'll be summer. The food's great. And, and we'll have a good time. For the second course, we're looking at, what are we Malacasa. looking at? Malacasa. It's, it's a range not very far out of Athens, 20, 20, 20 minutes, 20 k's, you know, 30 minutes drive. Um, it's got a lot of bays, nice and flat. And yeah, hopefully we can get a second course done there. Wonderful. So do you have any dates in mind that you're looking at? At this stage, we roughly looking at the 11th, the weekend of the 11th of June for our first course, whether that'll be in the north of Greece or closer to Athens, not quite sure yet. I'm talking to Alex in Bulgaria about whether we're going to host his course here as well. And we should have the dates set in stone uh, within the next two weeks. And then we'll definitely put something out there for people to start making bookings. Wonderful. <clears throat> So Grant, you have also taken the movement course. What did you think about that? Yeah, so I took the, well, the guys in Greece who don't know, I took the movement course one week before nationals. I believe it was one week. And then um, actually won my division at, at nationals. So 
it was able to combine basically all the movement, all the shooting, the stuff that I was good. You know, you're always good at shooting fast. You're always good at moving fast, but you're not good at combining those two. Um, that's what my problem was. So through Keto's course, I was able to actually combine them pretty well. Um, and then, yeah, managed to, to do the win. And, you know, one week before nationals, taking a two-day very intense class, you know, we shot over a thousand rounds. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better pre-match practice and training than, than that. So. And I have reduced the round count just because it's very difficult to come by ammunition right now. So I did reduce the round count to a maximum of 600. Most people will shoot around 400 rounds over the two days. So we do a little more dry fire and vision training and things like that, and not as much putting rounds down range just to save on cost. But yeah, that it's helps still us a, a very lot. intense class. It is indeed. Yeah. So Grant, do you? So Grant, do you feel that this class going into nationals had anything to do with your national title? Oh, absolutely. I, I fully admit that Kidder's class helped me win and I'll give her all the credit. <laughs> Um, towards that so yeah at, at the award ceremony uh, we did we hung our awards over around Kita's neck because quite frankly I wasn't the only one who took away medals uh, pretty much almost everyone in her class actually won won at least some stages or won their division or won their their um <coughs> their class so yeah at the award ceremony we all dumped our medals around Kita's neck and you can see the pictures of those because quite frankly it was it was her win not not necessarily ours you guys did the work. It was, as a coach, it was such a gratifying moment to see all of my students take the podium. It was yeah. just a beautiful moment. And if you can get Kira to actually come to the match, I mean, having her to be able to see the stages and coach you through the stages and she, Kira sees stages a bit differently than normal people. Um, she's an oddity. I'm not a normal people. <laughs> <laughs> so the way she actually approaches the stages is ingenious on its own. So Having her there, because I also did was able to pick her brain on two or three of the stages when I bumped into her. So, yeah, that also helped quite a lot. Okay. So, Grant, you had some questions for Paul? Yes, Paul. Okay, so you've been shooting for, some would say, a little little bit. Um, you started shooting about, what, 1990-something? Yeah, it's um, been a while. It's a bit, a bit of a time. Obviously, and you doesn't look a day over 35. Matches. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Kira. <laughs> what I got was I look old on this. Um, <laughs> so when you go to different matches and different continents, there's obviously a different flavor to that match. How do you find yourself adjusting to that flavor of the match from what you normally used to? Um, you know, you bring up a point that not a lot of people think about, and it's a good point. Um, I think one of the best things a shooter can do there's two that i'm going to say but one of the best things you can do is to get there early if you can get there to watch the pre-match and shoot a few rounds down range this is the beauty about greece every match we go to it doesn't matter what level it is they've got dedicated days where you can just go and shoot your heart out as much as you want and you can get the flavor that you talk of um, when you're going internationally it's a little bit more difficult but most of the international matches I've gone to also have that. So again, get there, get there early if you can and, and shoot away, get used to the weather, get used to the footing. The ground's going to be different. As you know, it's always different. Um, and just shoot a few rounds. So it becomes normal to shoot on that surface. Um, but for those who can't get there early, a lot of people fly into a match and they, they hit the ground running and the next day they, they're shooting the match. Um, it's really hard to adjust. Uh, one of the things I can suggest that I found helped me a lot um, is to shoot in different clubs, move around. Um, some countries it's easy to do, some countries it's not because there's only a couple of ranges. But in Greece, almost every weekend I'm at a different range. So I'm getting that exposure to that different environment. Even the weather's different depending on, on the altitude you're shooting at. The surfaces are all different. Some are on the beach like this weekend. We're shooting 50 meters away from the beach. So that exposure to different ranges is similar 
to shooting in a different country. It's a different range. It has its own dynamics. You're shooting in different directions. Frostproof, frostproof in Florida is a classic example of something if you're not used to it. Oh, you know, yeah. depending on which side of the range you're shooting on, you've either got the sun in your eyes in the morning or in the afternoon. Uh, so it's something you've got to get used to. And we didn't take that into account when we shot there. So yeah, just get around, go to different ranges, go to different clubs and get that experience of, of not just performing at your club where you've got that element of familiarity, which does build a false sense of security into your shooting. You've got to be able to perform mm -hmm. anyway. And most of us do do better at our home clubs for that very reason. Yeah. Home field advantage is a real thing. Yeah. So home field advantage. Are you participating in the next world shoot? Um, it's an interesting question again. All the questions It's a weird situation right now. I, other than that, I qualified for my slot in Australia, worked hard for my slot for world shoot in production. And I moved to Estonia and I was still an IPC member of Australia. So I maintained my slot. Moving to Greece, uh, the rules are a little bit different here. You can't be a member of another region. So I had to relinquish my IPC Australia membership and join Greece. And with that, I lost my slot. Um, I needed to get my, my membership sorted in Greece so I could get a gun license. So it's a bittersweet victory, if I can put it that way. Um, there are slots. All the slots from Greece, or most of the slots were returned. I think I can get a slot if I ask nicely, which will be great. But with the current situation and what's going on in the world, um, COVID as well, it, it makes it extremely difficult to book. You book hotels, you book flights. There's a lot of stories of people not getting their refunds. It, it's a difficult situation. And I'm, I'm seriously contemplating not even considering going to the world shoot. It's a very difficult time right now. And I don't know if we don't even know if they're going to continue to have it. Yeah. It postponed That's also how many thing, times now? I mean, we uh, speaking to a lot of guys, like we find out what in May or June, if the world is going to happen, then we have less than six months to now train for the world shoot. It, it's it, very it, difficult. It throws you off. So yeah. if you go to the world shoot this year, if they do have it, I don't, I, I can't think of anyone that's going to really be on top of their game. But is, it, is it a world shoot? Uh, uh, look, it's still a world shoot. If people don't attend for whatever reason that may be, I'm not going to say it's their choice not to attend because it may be there are many legitimate reasons. It's still a world shoot. Um, but no, I hear what you're saying. I mean, it's difficult. There's, there's restrictions in place for COVID that require you to isolate when you get there and then three or four days later, mm -hmm. you've got to do another one, which means you've got to get there pretty early, which means more time of work, extra costs, it's going to be extremely difficult. Things can change with COVID and that falls away, but we don't know. I, I, right. I find it extremely difficult to commit money and time to a match that I don't know, you know? So yeah, I'm, I'm probably, I'm probably looking at not going. Yeah. But you see, that's a the problem. Then if you don't have um, some of the top competitors of every country going to the world shoot, and in my mind, it's not a world shoot because you're not competing against the best of the best. That's why we're there. I mean, if you win your division and it's a, it's a win that everyone says, oh, well, so-and-so wasn't there. I mean, yes, it's, I mean, no, I, you can do the whole inch and a mile if, if wins a win kind of thing. You know, you can, you can pull that, that quotes out of the mix, but it's, is it really? I think the key words you said there were world shoot. You know, any other shoot, yeah, yeah so-and-so wasn't there, so-and-so wasn't there. World shoot, you want the best there. I hear you. Exactly. Yeah. So look, if I had anything to do with it, I would probably cancel it. Mm. So cancel so it and would, let's have it in another three years and let's actually have it. Yeah, that would, that would make it much easier for everybody involved. Um, we can start fresh and probably not three years. I, I would suggest probably if they gave us a good full 12 months, hoping COVID doesn't come up with another Greek lettered variant, um, we could... <laughs> We could probably have a world shoot because that was, yeah, that was our fault. We do apologize for that. We'll tell our scientists to rather drink beer and <laughs> call it something else. Stop using the Greek alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> got 24. There's 24 variants with us. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul, tell us about the, and maybe Alex, you can chime in here too. Tell us about the gun laws in Greece 
And mm -hmm. if anyone is flying internationally to take the Smart Move or Train Smart class, what obstacles will they have to overcome? How difficult will it be? Or is it going to be easy? What do they have to do to get there with their firearms? Well, um, I believe that uh, everybody who would like to possess a gun in Greece or bring a gun into Greece has to have a sporting license. Uh, he has to be an active member of uh, as a shooter. And, IPSC. Um, IPSC shooter, of course, and um, we will make the appropriate uh, subtraction to um, wait for these uh, people uh, in the range or wait them uh, by the time they arrive here, according to the dates that are going to be announced. And um, we will make a little um, uh, arrangements for a small uh, game or, uh, or training days and everything will be set. But the initial, the initial uh, th thinking should be that everybody should be an active um, uh, IPSC shooter. Okay. Uh, about the about um, the ammo here in Greece, as probably Paul told you, we are not able to have any reloaded uh, ammo, so we have to buy uh, factory ammo. We do have to have we do in Greece have a little limitation about how many guns uh, uh, we can have, like two guns each uh, shooter. Uh, IPSC shooter, or, or if someone is uh, in a high level and uh, I would say one championship or two championships or between the 10 best shooters in Greece, he can have a, a third or fourth uh, a gun to practice and uh, possess. Uh, generally, we expect to have a new low the next month to be equal um, ruling uh, for the guns uh, with all Europe, which is more flexible with ammo, with uh, possessing the guns. Uh, normally, we're not um, uh, carry guns. Uh, we're not allowed to have any uh, um, uh, personal, personal protection. Personal protection, yes. Even concealed uh, carrying is not allowed in Greece. But are you allowed um, to have access to your gun or do you have to leave it at the gun range like some European countries? I'm sorry? Do you have to, can you have access to your gun? Or do you have to leave it at the gun no, shop or we the do. gun range? We have personal responsibility okay. about guns. Uh, sometimes when we don't have to, when some, when some places we are not feeling safe to leave the gun, we, we keep them with us with the license on. We, uh, okay. we hold them in the bag. So you in can drive case. fire with the gun at your house? We, yeah. can have, we can have our guns at our houses in a safe. Okay. Uh, right. Similar laws to South Africa mm -hmm. and Australia, we can have it locked up. Um, you can't carry for personal protection without a special permit. You can get a permit. They're yeah. extremely difficult to get, but it's not, okay. it's not a given like in Estonia, when you have a gun license, you can carry it. No. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. okay. Now, what about bringing ammunition? So if someone is flying from Germany to take the class, can they bring their own ammunition with them? I think, I think they can do, you do. Yes. yes. I can declare that. Yes. They would declare that uh, as a, as a safety, as a security item on, uh, on board. I, either they come uh, by plane, either they come by car, and um, there's going to be a, a small procedure. There is an extra fee on the planes for carrying uh, ammo and uh, and guns, but it's all right. It's worth it. It's worth it to come in Greece and do some practice and do some uh, training and also enjoy the sea, the sun, and the food, as uh, Paul told you. And yeah, Alex. Alex. Alex often comes to matches from Bulgaria and yeah, the, we get a lot of international competitors coming here. They bring their own ammo. It's just a small procedure, but you can bring your own ammo and gun. Yes. Okay. So Alex, well, and Paul, were either of you there when they held the world shoot in Greece? We intend to. No, no. Were you here for the world shoot in Greece? Were you shooting IP? When was that? Uh, no, me, no, no, I, I not shooting yet. I wish, I wish I could, but I think I'm not that much experienced. I hope that will be in the next month uh, with your, your help, uh, with my friend here, Paul. We train together. We try to uh, to upgrade my shooting level, but uh, it needs some time. I'm not. Uh, I, I prefer that. I think that Paul will be probably more uh, competent uh, to do that than me but uh, I'm looking forward to if I can <laughs> I was I was at the world shooting Greece yeah 
And what did you think about that? How did that go? How was, I mean, I know there were some issues. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Mm -hmm. <laughs> there were a lot of issues. Um, look, first of all, it was a very important match for me because it was on my home island of Rhodes. That's my family home. Uh, I, I lived there once as a seven or eight year old for a few months, but used to go there often on holiday. All my family's there. So it was a special world shoot. It was also special because my kids shot that world shoot with me, my boys, Savas and Stavros. They're and very good shooters. Yes, they, it, it was really good. And thank you. And we, we had a good time there. But there were issues. Um, there were a number of issues. <laughs> you want me to expand, Kira? Yeah, so yes. So tell I want me to hear about what happened side. with the flights. Flights? Um, Do you know about that? No, I didn't have issues with flights getting into Greece. No, on the way in, everything was fine, but... When everyone was trying to leave, the flights were grounded. Ooh, I think I stayed a little bit longer for a holiday. Um, okay. Tell me so about So you were that. fine. I was fine. Another Two, interesting when was that, thing. Well, 2000, when was that, Kita? 2000 and? Oh, goodness. Uh, let's see. 12? I think it was 2012. I think Somewhere so. Somewhere around there, yeah. It was a while ago. So another interesting thing I heard was that the restaurants are open at very different times than in other parts of the world. Things normally fire up in Greece from 11 o'clock onwards at night. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit different, but there's always something open. Um, Rhodes Island, where the world shoot was, is not a very big island. You can do the whole circumference of the island in 24 hours easily having breakfast somewhere, lunch somewhere else, and, and dinner back where you started, for example. So it's not huge. And there's a lot of tourism that comes to roads. So it's always full. Um, we'll shoot in summer on roads. Accommodation's an issue. Um, so restaurants, everybody has siesta in Greece most of the time. The shops close uh, mm -hmm. lunchtime reopen later in the afternoon and, and generally clubs in that open at midnight and right through till the sun rises so a little bit different to what people are used to right yeah i know the, the americans would wake up early and try to go to a restaurant and nothing is open <laughs> and they're just trying to get breakfast so it's just Very a different true. culture <laughs> yeah we have cafe neos in the morning which is cafes which which will look after you with with food, but not the traditional style American breakfast that, that we right. know of, or, or the English breakfast style, but your croissants and your, your you speak, you know, all the filo pastry type stuff, yes. and tiropita, spanokopita, bugatsas, which are, are yes. really delicious, and, and your coffees. Um, and then, you know, by lunchtime, things are starting to open up and fire up, and then it gets back to normal. Yeah, and things well, well, are open very late into the evening. Very. They, they don't close. I think we left. We left the club at four thirty this morning. Yeah. <laughs> so you're well, tired. I Did think, you have your siesta? We we have not had siesta in three days. Our trip yeah. here to Patmos, the the ship leaves Athens at six. Six o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we get here at three in the morning. Uh, I don't sleep on a ship. It's just not something I can do. And then, you know, we got here. I couldn't sleep. The match was the same day we got here, so we were at the range by eight o'clock just after eight shot the match then it's celebrations now the beautiful thing i've been to two matches in greece now we're changing the subject slightly um these islands that host these matches they go all out we're talking about an entry fee of 30 euros hotel accommodation free and we had free oh, dinner wow. and dinner in greece dinner in greece isn't a plate of food in front of you out of a ziploc bag with gravy it's everything it's the salads, the meat, the different types of meat, the, the desserts, it's just full on. So, you know, 100 people came to this match, a new range. Uh, they've been around a few months. And they, they gave us free accommodation in a decent hotel, all of us, anyone who entered the match, and a free dinner. And we celebrated well last night together. It was really, really nice. Plus 50% well, 50 of uh, oh. reduction of the, of the cost of the ship, which is good. They organized discounts oh, nice. on the ships. Yeah. So there's no airport here. The locals don't want an airport. Um, and there isn't enough ground, I think, to have one. So ship is the way, and they got a nice discount for all of us there, too. 
So it sounds like you're like inviting people to come to the restaurant and then maybe shoot a match, you know. If, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, food, the, food, the food, yeah, is a big thing. The 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 phylloxenia, we call it in Greece. Yeah. The the way we look after our friends and our visitors, you're not going to find anywhere else in the world. I'm not saying that it's bad anywhere else. It's really, really good. In America, we felt very welcome to every time we've been there. Amazing people, amazing culture. And in South Africa, you know what we like. I mean, Keith has been hosted by you guys. It's amazing. But the Greeks have a special, there's a special knack there that I don't know what it is. Um, it's, it's amazing. It really is nice. You guys need to come to Greece. They treat you like family. So how long Absolutely. does your how long does your dinner go? Two three hours at least. Uh, at least at least. <laughs> if it is combined by music, by good wine, good company, then we we enjoy. It. Until four thirty like, uh, in the morning. Fast food. <laughs> <laughs> no 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 no. About about the food and the breakfast and all this. When they have major events like uh, world shoot or anything else, they. The restaurants and the people who do with the catering and food, they make their own arrangements for the appropriate time to open and have breakfast. Uh, and the hotels also do are informed. So maybe the, the traditional shops are getting late or they have siesta in the afternoon, as Paul says. But uh, you, you can find uh, to eat and uh, do your original schedule um, easily. So when so, you have a level three there, sorry, when you have a level three there, yeah. how many competitors do you have and what's the biggest um, division in Greece? Production's definitely the biggest division in Greece. There's no doubt about it, hands down. Um, and that's probably because of um, the cost of running open division. Most people are shooting standard minor. There's very few people shooting standard major. And as you know, we can't reload. So it's difficult for the open guys. It's difficult right. for the standard major guys. So production is definitely the biggest division. And your first question was about the numbers. It's, yeah. I can only comment on my five months experience here, but we had 100 people here at this match. It was a seven stage level two. 100 people attended from main, mainland. Main. It's an eight hour trip on the ship here. People came from Rhodes Island, came oh, from wow. mainland Greece. Mm -hmm. um, when we have a level three up in the north of Greece, we can get 150, yeah. Is it 200 people, and that includes internationals. Um, but COVID's been difficult, you know, whilst some right. people could travel, others couldn't. So it's hard to put a number on it, as you know. But yeah, um, World Shoot was oversubscribed in Greece. That was a while back. Mm -hmm. um, our Greek nationals was on, then it wasn't on, then it was put on at the last minute. So I think we had just under 200 people there. Corinth, which is the Canal Challenge, which is a match coming up this year. It's an exceptional location, and it's a really good match at a nice range. Um, probably going to have the CZ team there as well, so you guys should come along. Um, we only had 100 there last year, but again, it was right in the middle of, of when some countries were not allowed to move around and uh, we still pulled in internationals and we still had 100 people. So it's, it, it was very difficult during those times to, to get the numbers. Okay. So Alex, you're from Bulgaria? No, he's Greek. I'm Greek. You are Greek. Okay. I'm Greek. I'm originally Greek, yes. Okay. I was confused because Paul said earlier you came from Bulgaria. The other Alex. Other Alex. Be... Oh, other Alex. Okay, Hasht gotcha. Hashtag Too many Alex. DM Alex. <laughs> Got you. Okay. Now I'm caught up. All right, so Paul, do you have yeah. any training tips or tricks you'd like to share with our audience? Ooh. Um, Just sprung that one on you, huh? <laughs> yeah, hey, thanks, Kida. Out of um, the blue. I, I've, I've always been an advocate of dry fire, and I don't like doing it. But I, <laughs> I do, I, and it's, you know what? I was thinking about this the other day because I've actually been dry firing more. And it, it really comes down to availability of ammo and range access. Mm -hmm. um, I caught myself filming myself doing a little video for, for the gram where I was practicing my table starts, mag inserted chamber empty and unloaded starts. And I'm like, why am I not shooting? I had ammo in front of me. And I think it's, it's an availability. It's a cost thing. And I was doing just as well, fundamentally training the item I needed to train. So I think one of my tips would be, you know, you don't always need to shoot bullets. There is a time you have to shoot bullets. 
And there's a time you have to shoot a lot of bullets to, to really burn stuff in. Um, but you can also get a lot of effective training done, like unloaded starts, mag inserted. The gun doesn't have to go bang for you to become efficient and maximize and improve your skills for those start conditions. And that goes for a lot of other things as well. So I'm really going to advocate that a lot more now. Um, ammo companies are not going to like me. You can, you can get away with a lot of training uh, without actually firing around. And okay, so, whilst, yep. so in what situations do you feel it's necessary to use live am ammunition? One of, one of the places you're not going to get away with not shooting ammunition is your group shooting. You can set up laser training systems all you like, but unless you get in the recoil, no recoil, unless you're getting the recoil, which there are some systems that provide, and you're not getting the sight tracking where you're actually watching that front sight lift out of the notch and come back in if you're shooting hind sights like I do. But you're the not recoil going to with look, the CO2 is not the same. It's not the real I honestly, thing. I haven't tried it, so I'm glad you said that. Exactly. It can't be the same. So you're not going to get away with improving your group shooting um, unless you're shooting live ammo. And a, a lot of my time, I would go to the range to train X, Y, and Z skill because I don't go there without a plan. And I wind up shooting all my ammo on group shooting because with group shooting comes trigger control. And I'm training a lot of people in Greece and I'm finding the biggest issue with people not hitting where they're aiming on the target is not the way they line up the sights, Peter. It's their trigger control. I've said this for a while now and I'm seeing it. It's, it's really bad trigger control. And it's easy not to know how to press the trigger problem, uh, trigger properly. I, I do it. Uh, I think we all neglect the amount of work we put into pressing a trigger correctly under different circumstances too. But so, you can do that in dry fire. The problem is you, you have to know how the gun is going to behave in live fire to apply it to dry fire. Absolutely correct. I need to see the holes in the paper to know what my group size is doing. I need the recoil so I can manage my grip and focus on how I'm gripping the gun, if I'm gripping it correctly, uh, to see what my sight's doing. And, and I need it so I can and feel those shots off. Um, I, even though I can dry fire the trigger press, I still need the feedback on the target to know if it's actually been pressed correctly because the target's not going to lie to you. Mm. All right, so we have a listener question asking the two of you who have taken my class, what specific movements did you take from the class that you feel made, made you a better shooter? You want to go first? No, Paul, you're up first. You go first. <laughs> <Love> <laughs> you. like, I need to uh, think about this one. <laughs> no, no, I, I've got one in mind. Um, I, I think one of, the, one of the things for me that I struggled with on your course, there were a lot of things I struggled with because I wasn't doing them correctly, was the vertical movement. I'd never considered the vertical movement. And I'll explain it for the listeners that, that haven't done your course. You know, when you, when you enter a position, there's a, there's a technique to burn off your, your inertia. So you don't fall out of position. You can go in hard. And I was rising from that technique. I was coming back into my fully normal upright position. And that's a lot of wasted movement again, which translates into a certain amount of time before you break the shot. And it also affects you exiting that position again, because you're now going to drop your weight to exit. So you, you're doing something twice that's not necessary. So for me, it was that wasted um, energy and time in, in moving up vertically. So vertical movement for me was one of the biggest things. Yeah, okay. and that Mine was, that's a technique. Sorry. That's a technique that used to be commonly accepted where you add vertical movement to help yes. slow yourself down. But the problem yeah. is, as soon as you're moving vertically, now your sights are also moving vertically. And then you have to take the time to get down to move again. So it adds at least a tenth of a second to every position. Correct. All right, go ahead, Grant. I cut you off there. <laughs> That's fine. Um, yeah, mine was definitely shifting weight. Um, something that I'd never even considered doing the shifting weight in and out of position or shifting weight through a position that, yeah, that, that definitely opened up a lot of doors and a lot of momentum going through a stage. Yeah. When you think about shooting on the move, typically you're thinking of shooting while moving your feet, right? But a lot of times we're shooting on the move without actually moving our feet. You're just shifting your weight through the position. And once you start to apply that to 
more difficult targets where you can't be picking up and putting down your feet or your sights are going to be bouncing. You're not going to hit it, but treating them as shooting on the shift, you can get away with a little bit of movement and still hit your target. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good technique for shifting weight. Yeah. Cause you know, like always like set up, shoot the hard target, then move. And I'll set up and start shifting weight through the hard target. You know, that and of course, there's a limit to that. At some point, you're going to have to be static for a more difficult target. But for you, for your skill level, figuring out, okay, at this target difficulty, I know I can hit that target, hit an alpha while shifting my weight. Or this one's a little bit easier. I know I can actually be moving my feet, picking up and putting down my feet and still get my hits on that target. And also, that limit is always moving because you're always training and practicing and getting better. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. It does move. I mean, this match this weekend, um, I, you know, when I walk through a stage nine planet, all the techniques we learned with you come into mind and I'm looking and identifying where I can apply them. And I, I applied that technique on, on a stage and it, it, it just triggers you when you when you know what you're looking for and you're selecting what technique you're going to use on that stage. And there could be a number of techniques you use, different movement techniques um, that that basic training comes back in uh, when i say basic i mean it's ingrained into your mind because you've done it you've practiced it you've gone to the range and trained it and now you're going to the stage and you're looking at it and going where can i apply this technique oh there's one i can put there and it all falls into place it's really really good yeah i like how you say it's basic training because movement is fundamental just as much as gripping the gun pulling the trigger straight it's fundamental it's something that needs to be automatic ingrained that subconscious that you don't have to really even think about you just do it brilliant uh, okay also on you've obviously seen, seen a lot of the changes in equipment and that do you think that having the better gun the heavier gun matters at the hop, at the top level having the speed holster having all that good gear does it matter you're asking me or Kira? I'm asking you. I think it matters more at the top. I think that's where I think it that's makes the, the only difference. place it matters. <laughs> you want to expand? Because, I mean, you're shooting factory ammo, so you're probably not running the lightest springs you can in your gun. Am I correct? Absolutely right. I've had to, I've had to fiddle with different spring weights, and it took me a while to set the gun up. I'm really happy now. Um, and it's interesting, I had to go up in recoil spring weight, which I'm so used to dropping it as low as I can. Yeah. But um, I have found a setup that works really, really well. It's not far off what I'm used to doing. And it comes back to how you fundamentally set up a gun. To answer your question, though, and, and Q is 100% right, I think it matters most at the higher levels because we're splitting hairs. By no means am I suggesting that I'm in Eric's league of shooting, please. Uh, I think with someone like Eric and JJ and, and, and your, your masters at that level, it doesn't matter what you give them. They're still going to do extremely well. But yeah. it does matter when you've got two guys competing against each other and one has a gun that's a little bit more stable recoil-wise than another. He gets his sight back a bit faster because our splits are similar. Our transitions are similar. Our loads, our movements are similar because we're all really training the same stuff. Um, take headspace out of it and it comes down to equipment you know take headspace out of it we're doing the same techniques and training it's you know it comes down to equipment so i think it's it's really more important at the higher levels yeah having a race holster versus a kydex holster isn't going to make or break you at the lower levels in fact it could be a hindrance to have a race holster and then you go to draw your gun and it falls on the ground and you're disqualified <laughs> <laughs> and that difference yeah. in your draw isn't going to make any difference at that level. It's not until you get to the top and you're, like you said, splitting hairs, fighting for that tenth of a second that wins or loses the world shoot. Yeah, I think it makes a difference. Um, and another thing I want to say is people often ask me, is it worth me doing this? Is it worth me doing that to my gun? And I go to them, unless it's ridiculous, I say, no, don't do that. That's, that's really silly. Um, but if it's like someone going, should I put a fiber optic front side? Should I do this? Should I sh do that? Should I put brass grips on my gun? And I go, look, do you feel it's going to help you? 
do you feel it's going to help you? And they go, yes. I said, well, it's a psychological thing. Forget the, the physical side to it. But if psychologically you believe it's going to assist you, take it. It it's, creates... It's, it creates almost a new girlfriend syndrome. Like, oh, I'm excited. I got it. brass yeah. grips on my gun. This is so much fun to dry fire now. And you're going to get better because now you're excited to train again. It's handling the gun a lot more all of a sudden. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I always look, if it's going to help you and it's not ridiculous, do it. It, it all adds up. But Paul, do you have any sponsors you would like to talk about? Yes, thank you, Kida, for giving me an opportunity to mention them. You know, um, sponsorship at my level of shooting isn't what people may think it is, but it all helps so much. Um, I'd like to thank my current employer, Pro System Armory, which is the Kalkanzakos family. They've been in business in Greece for three generations uh, as the CZ importer and distributor. And they've been amazing. They're family to me. Um, they treat me like family. And it's really great working with people who are passionate about the sport. Um, I'd like to talk about Double Alpha. Saul and Eli I've been involved with since the Australasians that was held in New Zealand that was part of the Australian Nationals. It's a long time ago, probably around 14, 15 years ago. Um, oh, they've always fantastic. been. Yeah, that was really nice on Rotorua. Um, and I enjoyed that smell on that island too. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> um, oh my goodness yeah that ooh. if you don't know it's basically heated underground um there's like steam underground that makes it smell like farts it's the sulfur yes the sulfur coming out yeah and so they actually alpha. can heat their houses from this volcanic activity underground it's really an amazing place and it's beautiful but the smell yeah, all, does take a little getting used to <laughs> It's all geothermic water that heats and power stuff. That's really, really good. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting smell. But I quite enjoyed it. Uh, it's better than your normal smells in big cities of traffic and congestion. So it was quite nice. That's true. But That's fair. Double Alpha, um, really, really good quality gear. I think one of the important things to remember about them is that Saul Kirsch himself was a top level shooter for many, many, many years. So he, yes. out of necessity. Um, built and designed stuff to help him in his shooting, which he began marketing. And he's, he's developed a, a, a very impressive company with a lot of good stuff for new shooters, seasoned shooters, and, and our, their quality is unsurpassed. Really good stuff. And Saul and Kirsch actually... It, yep. Sorry? Carry on. So, Saul Kirsch actually made a contribution to my book, Smart Move, Economy of Motion for the Shooting Sports, talking about going prone and things like that. And Paul, you also made a contribution on grip. So you're both yes, in I there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've changed sorry. my grip since then. I've changed my grip since then, but it's, what I what I wrote and described is still 100%. It's still so relevant. It's still relevant, yeah. And obviously CZ guns, um, also very, very family orientated, very interested in what shooters are doing what they need. They've been really helpful in developing me as a shooter. Um, we're a good team. I can't thank them enough for their product and it is a wonderful product. Um, I really enjoy working with them. Um, going to be very fortunate to see them at the Iwa Shot Show next week. I leave for Nuremberg on Thursday, so I'm looking forward to catching up with everyone there and, and having a few conversations. Wonderful. Cool. Alex, was there anything that you wanted to add that you didn't get a chance to say? You've been pretty quiet back there. I'm just, I'm just listening to all these uh, um, significant uh, things about uh, shooting from more experienced athletes, from Paul, from you, and uh, other more participants on the web. But uh, I am uh, feeling lucky that uh, we have so many good athletes that would, they would like to share their skills and uh, abilities with us, the newest uh, IPC shooters. And uh, we are looking forward to catch them all like a sponge. We are very, very keen on learning and we would like to make another uh, smart move and uh, 
have uh, all the best uh, nice weekend. One, yes, yes. we'll all make a best. smart move and have you to come to Greece. Yes, yes, exactly. We're going to have so much fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Grant, Don't forget do to bring have... the bathing suit, eh? Bathing yes. suit. Oh, bathing suit. I will also be bringing my daughter, Pixie. Her name's Michaela. She goes by Pixie. So she's been my little range helper. She picks up all the brass, resets the targets, so the shooters can just come and enjoy, and they don't have to worry about doing any work. Lovely. She's going to love it, Jim. Yep. Cool. Well, guys, it was awesome to talk to you. I really look forward to um, having dinner with you and maybe shoot a match on the side. Um, so hopefully sometime this year we can make that happen. hope so, buddy. It'll be good to see you. Thanks very much, Kida. Appreciate the time, and we'll chat during the week. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for having us on the show. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.